They both deny having anything to do with the death of Ted Binion. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew. On Monday, February 13th, 2017, at approximately 1 o'clock p.m., 13-year-old Abby Williams and 14-year-old Libby German were dropped off by Libby's sister near an abandoned rail bridge in Delphi, Indiana. The two young teenagers were just going to walk around and hang out. They were scheduled to be picked up at 3.15 by Libby's father, but the girls never showed up. The family began to search and then called police. At approximately 12.15 p.m. on the next day, February 14th, the bodies of the two girls were found in a wooded area near the Delphi Historic Trail, approximately one half mile upstream from the bridge. During the course of the investigation, police released this short video of the suspect recorded on Libby's phone that man has never been identified and no one has been charged with the murders. But now, five years later, a warrant has been uncovered which may reveal a lot more information about exactly who police believe may be responsible. Tonight, we take an in-depth look at this new information. Does it solve the Delphi murders of Abby Williams and Libby German? I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here for Closing Arguments. And tonight we are taking a deep dive into the Delphi murders. And as I sit here tonight, I am still surprised, somewhat shocked, that five years later, this case has not been solved. But new information we're going to take a look at tonight may open some eyes about what really happened to Abby and Libby. Now, let's begin with what I think is at the heart of all of this, which, which are, are police in this case. And, and, and police are in charge of this investigation. And, and generally, you know, folks like you and I in the true crime world, we like to believe in and trust our police. And they have a job to do. Their job is simple but not easy, right? Arrest the bad guys. That's what they have to do. Figure out. Who it is that committed the crime? In this case, we're talking about the murder of two young teenage girls. And, and that's their mission. And, and whatever it takes to get that done, that's what they will do. Now, in this story, in this investigation, in this case, there's another party that is very involved and invested in all of this, and that's the media. The media absolutely invested in this case, and, and, and the job of the media always is to get the story, right? Get the story. Find out what the story is. And, and in this case, the story is, who are these young girls? What happened to them? And finally, who is responsible? And you and I both know that in the world of true crime, you know, investigators are doing their job. The media, when I say media, I mean, you know, guys like me. Uh, folks like Judge Ashley here on Court TV, podcasters, writers, anyone, all members of the media, all trying to get that story. But we don't have the whole story here. And police have not gotten the bad guy yet, which, which gets me to the relationship between the police and, and, and media. You know, we're, we're, we're sometimes great friends. Sometimes we're enemies. And, and sometimes it's like the media gets angry at, at investigators for whatever reason. You're not giving us the information. You're not answering the questions. Sometimes investigators get angry with us because we're asking too many questions or releasing information that is impeding their investigation. So there's a friction there. And a lot of times that friction plays out early on in an investigation, right? When, when, when police are... are, are first investigating the case, and you know how critical those first 48 hours are. But then when the case gets a little bit older, um, you know, 
sometimes you think about, well, what's going on here? Why hasn't this case been solved? And many times, that's when the media kind of dives in a little deeper, gets a little more aggressive. And sometimes you see that ends up resulting in new information uncovered, eyes opened, and sometimes people get arrested. Let's talk about the story that we're talking about tonight. It's about two young girls, Abby and Libby. They, they're two good friends. But it's been five long years now, and we don't have an answer as to what happened and how they were murdered and who is responsible. So take a look. We have some video, some, some images of Abby and Libby. Again, I said, great friends, did things together, just normal, normal teenage girls. But on February 13th, 2017, they went walking on a trail dropped off uh, by Libby's sister near the, the Monon High Bridge in the town of Delphi, Indiana. On the 13th, they were supposed to be picked up by uh, Libby's dad around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They didn't show up. The family knew something was wrong. They were searching. They called police in. And then, unfortunately, uh, the next day around noon, uh, their bodies were discovered. Now, during the course of this investigation, police have held all their information very close, very tight, not releasing things, releasing little tiny slivers of information. One of those little slivers is a video of the suspect. Let's take a look at that cell phone video. Libby actually recorded this on her cell phone. And we've been looking at this video uh, for a couple of years, a few years now, wondering who is this guy? And, and how is it that we have not been able to identify him? Someone who knows him, I would think, would be able to recognize him. Delphi, not a big town, folks. Not a big town whatsoever. Then, after they re released the video, they released a little piece of audio to see if anyone would recognize the voice. Let's take a listen. Down the hill. Down the hill. That's where they ended up going. That's where they were found. Down the hill. Um, then there were some sketches released as well. Well, we've got to, and I always wondered about this. Why are we releasing sketches if we've got an actual video? I, I didn't understand that. But there were two separate sketches that looked nothing alike that were released. And I asked Abby's mom about it. Take a listen. Does Indiana State Police noted when they produced the second set that well, they felt like the first one was important, so was the second, and that we need to spend as much time focusing on the second one as we did the first one for obvious reasons. We felt like we knew who the first person the sketch was, and now it was time to focus on the other person that we didn't know who was out there that day. So I believe they noted that, and that's what we've been told, and that's what we need to press forward with. So a lot of confusion in this case. There's been a lot because little pieces of information, not a lot of explanation. But I understand we're the media. We want the answers. We want to get the story. Investigators want to solve the case. And, and they're holding back things for investigative purposes. Okay? But it's been five years. That's where we are. Let me uh, bring in my guests uh, joining me tonight, if, if I can. Joining me in studio, Court TV anchor Ashley Wilcott, who has spent time in Delphi. Thanks so much, uh, Judge. Great to see you. Also with us. Uh, a couple of podcasters uh, joining us tonight in Indianapolis, Indiana. Podcasters of the Murder Street podcast, Anya Kane and, and Kevin Greenlee are with us. We just can't put them up on the screen yet, but we'll get to them in just a second. Let me begin with you, Judge. Thanks um, for having me. Great to see you in person. Um, you were there. Tell me about your trip to Delphi, what you saw, what sort of struck you sure. about the case. Listen, Vinny, five, three years, three years after they disappeared, still no answers in spite of the video, the pictures, the sketches, the audio that you referenced. So we went to Delphi, and I'm going to say this, a quaint, beautiful place. It was uh, March, beginning of March 2020, so it was cold, but it was a beautiful blue sky. It was sunny. This is a picture. Now, you cross the big bridge, the Monan Bridge that you referenced, and as soon as you cross the bridge, the trailhead starts. And this are people that I was with walking the trailhead. 
exactly where these girls walked. This is what it looked like if you look down to the right. Beautiful, beautiful. But what do you not see in these pictures? People. And everyone I spoke to said before this happened, there were people, Vinny, even on cold days. If the sun was out, the people were out. When we were there, noon, people might be out on lunch. Nobody was walking. Nobody. It was eerie. It was quiet. It was not what people said it was like before these two girls were murdered. It was creepy. It was creepy. And we walked and it was quiet. You could hear everything. There was no traffic on the interstate. There was no one in the woods. The further you walked, the quieter it got. And you look around. In that time of year, it's the same time of year as when they were murdered. No leaves on the trees pretty barren, so you could see all the way down the right. hill like that picture just showed. You could see forever in front of you because it wasn't as if the trees were covered with leaves like they would be at a different time of year. So all I could think were two things. Number one, this has affected this community to an extent that they don't even use a beautiful park because of what happened there and the tragedy. But number two, Vinny, how did someone not see something? Look at what the picture just looked like. How did someone not see or hear these girls disappear and get killed? Yeah, especially I mean, if there's other folks there. And, and, it, and you, as you referenced, at that time, it was much more popular. It was February. Maybe it was a little bit colder on that particular day on the 13th. Um, are you shocked that we're here in 2022 now and still no one has been held responsible? Absolutely. I was shocked three years ago. It's why I went on my own dime to this place because I couldn't believe it. And then you saw a little picture of a memorial. And that's where if we walk down the path that there was the picture of, you get to where two paths merge. And right at that corner, before you get to the bridge that this photo audio was taken on, or the video rather, that's where that memorial was. And there's a picture of the map and, and exactly where you can follow the trail. And Vinny, how can this not be solved? How can this not be solved? I thought this three years ago. Are you kidding me? How many times do you have a teenager murdered who must think, I'm in trouble. This is a bad guy. I better make sure my phone's on and get a video and an audio, and we still haven't caught them. And we haven't. Well, let, let's get to the bottom of what we do know tonight, and a lot has to do with our two guests joining us now in Indianapolis. Uh, podcasters from Murder Street, incredible podcast. Make sure you check it out. Every detail, every every bit of information in this case is in that podcast. Kevin Greenlee and uh, Anya Kane, uh, great to see you again tonight. Let me start here. Um, you've uncovered this new warrant. Tell me in general um, how you got your, or maybe you can't reveal how you got your hands on the warrant, but you got the warrant. Where's this warrant once? Is this warrant an FBI warrant? Yes. Uh, thanks so much for having us on. Um, this is a warrant that was written up by an FBI agent uh, out of the uh, area around Chicago. And uh, we can't talk about how we got it, but basically um, it's new information to the public, but it's actually quite an old warrant. This was written up in March of 2017, so a month after the murders. Let me put up on the screen a little bit from this. And again, we've got with us uh, Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee from the Murder Sheet podcast. Um, this is what they got. And, and it says on it that LG and AW were found dead with wounds caused by a blank weapon on the property owned by Ronald Logan. The location of the crime scene is approximately 1,400 feet from Logan's residence. Now, um, tell me a little bit about that. Um, the location of the crime scene versus where... Uh, Ronald Logan lives. Like, how would you get from Logan's house to, to where this all is? The bodies were found basically about 1,400 feet from his back door. And of course, if you have a couple of dead bodies found on your property, the police are going to get interested. And so they were interested in Logan. And there were a couple of other reasons why they were interested in him at that time including the fact that he had a history of committing domestic violence against his uh, adult female partners, and also that during the time of the murders, he actually lied about his whereabouts. Oh, that's a little bit of a problem. Slight problem there on that one. Let me put up on the screen some more information we have uh, uh, from what you uncovered here. You've got, it also appeared that the girls' bodies were moved and staged... There was um, no visible signs of a struggle or a fight. And then that final one, that to me, this is the, the one that's got my head exploding tonight. 
On March 12, 2017, Blank explained in an interview to law enforcement that Logan called him on the morning of February 14, 2017 and asked him to provide the alibi for Logan's drive to the aquarium in Lafayette. This phone call was made prior to law enforcement's discovery of Libby and Abby's deceased bodies. Am I reading this right, that according to this warrant, he's calling someone for an alibi before anyone knows there's a murder? That's correct. Um, one thing that's interesting about Mr. Logan is that he was on probation at the time of the murders. So he was not supposed to be driving and he was that day. So um, it's, it's one of those things. It's certainly uh, and, and rightfully uh, attracted the interest of law enforcement at the time, but there's also an alternate explanation that he possibly was trying to uh, get out of something or get ahead of something without necessarily being aware of how serious this situation was involving these two girls. Okay, let me ask the judge. Judge, <laughs> someone, all right, and he may be asking for, a, for, for an alibi for driving because I'm not supposed to drive because my license is suspended and I'm on probation. I don't want to get in trouble. But do you call someone up, like, the day after you drive? Like, you haven't been, was, wait, let me ask, was he caught driving? Did anyone say you were out driving? Did someone catch him driving? Is that what happened here? Uh, they basically asked him, I believe, what were you doing this afternoon? And he was he was driving. So I think it was uh, either admit to, you know, admit to a probation violation or lie and get someone to back you up. But, but what's the, the, the timing of it? He's not questioned about driving until after the bodies are discovered, right? Well, the, the day the girls went missing, pretty much everyone in the area was asked, where were you this afternoon? Did you see anything? Okay. And so he was, yeah. So you certainly ask basic questions like that. Okay. So he's asked basic questions. All right, let me bounce this off the judge. Judge, what do you think? Um, if you're illegally driving a car that's suspended, could get in trouble, right? Judge could throw you in the can for that, violating mm -hmm. your probation. Um, does that make sense that he's getting the alibi? I don't think it passes the smell test, Vinny. It doesn't seem... Like, that would be the reason that a person gets an alibi. If they choose to drive while they're on probation, they choose to drive. Okay, I was driving. Better get an alibi. I don't, to me, doesn't carry enough weight. I don't believe it. Yeah. That, I, I, it, but there's, there's always a little explanation, right? Okay. Kevin, on your staying with us uh, throughout the, the hour here. Uh, Judge Ashley, working late for us tonight, coming in. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you, Benny. it. Great Happy to, see to be you. here. Great to see you. All right, when we come back, we've got much more to get through here. Um, wow. How about the man who called up for the fake alibi? What does he look like? And, and does he look like the person in the video? Is there any similarity between the two? Like, do they have similar jackets or hats or anything? I don't know. We'll take a look when we come back.
officially licensed everything. Welcome back. The probable cause warrant that was obtained and released by the Murder Sheet podcast specifically states that Ronald Logan is physically similar to that suspect we just saw in the cell phone video taken by Libby German. That's how the document reads. Logan's physical build is consistent with that of the male suspect videoed by Libby on the Monin High Bridge. And it also states that Logan's voice is not inconsistent with that of the person in the video. Interesting, Ronald Logan spoke with a reporter from Indianapolis news station WTHR the day after the bodies of Abby and Libby were discovered in 2017. And take a look at his appearance. I mean, tan hat, blue windbreaker. Let's watch some of what he told WTHR back in February of 2017. Who would have thought they'd let their children out to do something special that day, take a trip down and then turn out with a, a disaster like this? The area that they were in is very hard to get to. I mean, you, you, you can't get there unless you walk there. I mean, so... Somebody would be walking with them or something. Wow. Let's bring our guest back in. Joining us tonight in Winchester, Virginia, body language expert, Dr. Stephen Langston, in Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen, and still with us in Indianapolis, Indiana, the co-podcasters of Murder Sheet. Again, folks, check it out. It's got everything. Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee, still with us. Stephen Langston, want to ask you first, as we took a look at Ronald Logan in that interview with the news, local news comes around, microphone, um, anything strike you about what he said or how he said it? There, you know, there's two things that really stand out in that particular cut. You see his shoulders are constantly doing this, this shrugging motion here, which is a, uh, you know, uh, could be, could not be, I'm not really sure, but he's saying some very definitive things about how it's not possible, but he keeps doing this. You can't unsee that uh, when, whenever a person's talking about it, they're really uncertain about what they're trying to say, that shoulder shrug kicks into play. But really, I focus in on his mouth there. He is showing some signs of disgust. Uh, you can see the corner of his mouth pulling down. It's hidden by his glasses. I wouldn't be surprised at all if you could see some of that scrunching of his nose, but he has this real just kind of a, I'm sick of I'm sick to my stomach or I'm disgusted with either what's happening what I'm saying of course we don't know what's going on in his mind by any means but these definitely showing some very serious signs of disgust as he's talking through this part Jason Jensen private investigator um, I know you've been taking a very close look at this case um, your thoughts about uh, Ronald Logan and the video that we see Ronald Logan what he looks like it's his property and you've got investigators here saying there are consistencies in his general build and the build of the person in the video. Well, yes, exactly, Vinny. Uh, where the FBI agent says there's consistency with this build, we can go on a step further and say that the actual jacket that he's worn two days later during the interview is very similar, if not the exact jacket, and that ball cap has even the same dimples across the top that if you didn't know better, you'd say that this is indeed uh, this per individual being video recorded, but law enforcement hasn't come out and said that. They just said this is the suspect, but looking the two, comparing the two side by side, it looks like the exact same person. You just don't have the visual uh, clarity with the Snapchat video that you have with the reporter recording. Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee, um, your thoughts uh, and, and, and what have you uncovered about Ronald Logan, the way he looks, his physical attributes, right? We're looking for this guy in the video. Are, are there things that you've noticed or picked up that are either consistent or inconsistent uh, with that being a match? 
Um, one thing we can say is that uh, some of his uh, people who knew him basically said to law enforcement in the warrant that they felt that uh, the bridge guy, so to speak, looked like Ron Logan. So there was some feeling among people who knew him that it could be him. So people who actually, and this is what I've been saying all along. I'm like, I look at that video and if someone knows that person, I think they would recognize him. Do we know if those folks came forward voluntarily, like early on, once the video's released, saying, hey, did they pick up the phone and say, hey, that could be um, uh, Ron, Ronald Logan? In the probable cause affidavit the, the FBI agent wrote to secure the warrant, uh, she specifically says that there were 15 tips from the public, people who came forward with information that they believe connected Logan to the murders. Wow. Uh, so... Here, here we are, Jason Jensen. Again, in five years, five years, and and again, investigators, not, and and I understand. I'm a former prosecutor. I know what it takes to prove a case beyond any and all reasonable doubt. Um, but I'm seeing circumstances here, Jason. We're, we're, someone looking to make up an alibi, you know, looking for a fake alibi. Yeah, he's got another argument for it. But then it's his property, 1,400 feet from his backyard. 1,400 feet from his backyard. Don't we look at, like, the, the closest people first, Jason? Yes, they always do. They always look to see who either who was either in close proximity to the victims in the crime scene, as well as relatives or somebody that may have a motive to cause this, you know, a death of somebody. But here, we got under the totality of the circumstances, a lot of different things that come together and, and portray a picture that... Ronald Logan is likely the, the murderer here. Let me ask you, uh, Anya, um, the video that they released, is there, I presume there's a much longer video and they've just released a little piece of it. What do we know about that? And what do we know about the way the man on the bridge is walking? So many people have talked about that through the years. Is it an optical illusion because it's a, a short video that, it, that we're looping or is that is there something to the way he walks? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I know that it is a longer uh, recording that they have from Libby's phone. It's about 53 seconds long. And the conversation, the guys down the hill happens at the end of that video. So um, I, in terms of how he's moving, people have speculated that a lot. Some people think he looks like he's limping. Others look like it's a, a unusual gait, perhaps. Um, one thing that if you've actually been to the site, uh, it's a terrifying bridge. The, uh, the basically, it, it's very, it looks like it would be difficult to walk on. It's very spaced out. It's very high up. Uh, it looks like it's rotting. And um, so I've always wondered if this was a person who was uh, unaccustomed to being up there and maybe just a little bit nervous. I will note that Mr. Logan was in his 70s at the time of the murders. So that has made some people wonder, is a man in his 70s going to be able to just kind of casually stroll across this with such ease. Stephen Langston, do you see anything in the in the way he's moving his body? Does that tell you anything? It's just a short piece uh, of that video as we take a look at the bridge here. Uh, you, you definitely can see him looking down. Now, whether or not that is trying to hide the face or he is looking, you look at the picture there with that separation between the rails. It is a treacherous thing. It could be a gate. Uh, but having his head down, hands in his pockets, it was also cold. Uh, there's lots of things there that could be very circumstantial, though. Walking across that bridge, I'd probably have my eyes pointed down, too, wanting to know what I was having on. Yeah, and by the way, I would never myself walk across that bridge. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Langston, appreciate your insight tonight. Uh, joining us tonight in Virginia, great to see you again. Um, Anya, Kevin, Jason Jensen, all staying with us. Uh, when we come back, let's talk about what police are saying, investigators, right? I mean, they, they are saying some things, but how does it line up in the timeline of everything that we know at this point? That's next.
0.85 now. I believe that, that while I'm the superintendent of the state police, uh, we'll identify this individual. That's within two years, sir. Three. Three years. Three years. Two didn't, years and 11 months. They didn't want to push you out. Yeah. So you think within three years something will, will develop? It could be today. That was Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter speaking to WRTV's Rafael Sanchez. That was February of this year. Now, Carter appeared on several TV programs around that time as February marked five years since Abby and Libby were killed. In an interview with Good Morning America, Carter spoke directly to the killer. My resolve to catch him is as strong now as it was day one. But the difference now between now and, and day one is we know about you, a lot about you. Today could be the day. Sleep well. All right, let's bring back in our guests. Joining us now in Chicago, Illinois, private investigator Erica Morse, and still with us, private investigator Jason Jensen, and podcasters of the Murder of the Murder Sheet podcast, Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee, still with us. Um, timeline. February this year, when the superintendent's speaking, um, Kevin, um, Ronald Logan, the man we've been talking about tonight, has passed away. At the time he spoke in February, was Ronald Logan alive? At the time the superintendent spoke in February, Ronald Logan had already passed away. And that's an interesting point to make because during the course of that interview, uh, Superintendent Carter made it clear that he thought that the person responsible for these crimes was still alive. And certainly behind the scenes, we hear from police that they are more interested in the Klein angle than in the Ronald Logan angle. It's, it's fascinating, and we're going to get into that in just a second. Erica Morse, great to see you. Um, we've been talking a lot about what Murder Sheet uncovered, the warrant from the FBI. We looked at this guy, Ronald Logan, kind of got the build. It's his property. He's asking someone to give him an alibi before the bodies are discovered. Um, what are your thoughts about Ronald Logan and police seemingly uh, not interested or not believing that he's, he's connected here? Hey, Vinny, um, my thoughts are he makes great reasonable doubt. So they need to firm this up and they need to firm this up quickly. Um, whenever I'm looking at a case, I always look at it from the standpoint of a defense attorney and where there are gaps and, excuse me, where there are holes. And what we don't want is for one of those gaps or one of those holes to be what catches us up in a trial. We want to make sure that we are doing our jobs and filling those holes. And this thing about Ronald Logan, first of all, to the murder sheet, you guys are relentless and kudos to you because every case deserves relentless. And thank you for uncovering this amongst all the other earlier stuff that you've uncovered. But, um, you know, man, 15 um, calls to the tip line. I had that noted as well. That cannot be ignored. Roll this in or roll this out and move on. Yeah, I'm a former prosecutor. You know that, Erica. I mean, Ronald, if they arrest someone else, Ronald Logan is the reasonable doubt in that case. I mean, he becomes what the case is all about from the defense perspective, obviously. Let's right. take a listen to here. This is Sergeant Jeremy Pierce from the Indiana State Police talking about now that other twist um, that has me more confused than anything in this case. It all has to do with a guy named Anthony Schatz. While investigating the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, detectives with the Carroll County Sheriff's Office and the Indiana State Police have uncovered an online profile named Anthony Schatz. This profile was being used from 2016 to 2017 on social media applications, including but not limited to Snapchat and Instagram. The fictitious Anthony Schatz profile used images of a known male model and portrayed himself as being extremely wealthy and owning numerous sports cars. The creator of the fictitious profile used this information while communicating with juvenile females to solicit nude images, obtain their address, and attempt to meet with them. Detectives are seeking information about the person who created the Anthony Schatz profile. 
Investigators would like any individual who communicated, met, or attempted to meet the Anthony Schatz profile to contact law enforcement. Okay. Anya, I know you guys have uncovered information related to Anthony Schatz as well. So what is the connection, the nexus between Libby and Abby and this Anthony Schatz profile, this fake profile, not the guy that we see in the pictures, but someone else behind it. What's the connection uh, to Abby and Libby here? So uh, the connection is very strong between Anthony Schatz and, and the girls, the victims in this case. Basically, as, as we understand it from the transcript, Libby German was in contact with this Anthony Schatz profile shortly before her murder, was communicating with this person who she thought was a, a boy closer to her age. And um, in, in fact, according to the detectives during the, trans, uh, during the interrogation of Kagan Klein, uh, they said that she was actually enthralled by this person because again, she thinks she's talking to another teenager and is just you know being a typical teen online. And unfortunately, this turned out to be a predator. Was th that the reason that they went there that day? Was it to meet Anthony Schatz? That's not clear. What we do know is that Libby was definitely interested in wanting to meet Anthony Schatz. And we know that the day after the crime, one of Libby's friends wrote to Anthony Schatz and said, isn't it a shame what happened to Libby? And he wrote back, well, she was supposed to meet me, but she didn't show up. So those uh, facts certainly suggest that there was a planned meeting, but we don't know that for sure. There's no actual hard conclusive evidence of that. Jason Jensen, so this is uh, one of those twists in this whole case that is there any connection between Ronald Logan and Anthony Schatz? Because that would be another place to look, right? Is there any way, because they're saying there's other people connected to this fake social media account uh, Jason, have you been able to find any connection between these two? There hasn't been any connection between Anthony Schatz and Ron Logan. Clearly, Ron Logan was the uh, resident right there at the trail. And uh, Anthony Schatz is a fake profile for a Keegan Klein, uh, an individual in a nearby town of Peru, Indiana. So how is this guy related to Ron Logan is really the question that we're all looking to find. Is there any connection, uh, Anya? As far as we've been able to find, no. Okay, Erica Morse, this is, uh, you've investigated so many cases. Um, this is one of those situations where you're looking at, okay, this Anthony Schatz is the one. No, no, Ronald Logan is the one. How do you... How do you put these pieces together and have them make sense? Well, first of all, I'm concerned that law enforcement is losing control of this narrative. Um, the public and um, everything from podcasters to investigative reporters, everybody is digging into this while law enforcement remains silent. And I've worked cases just like it, and that's where there are an opportunity for a PI or a really strong advocate or podcaster to come forward and take control of this narrative and really start steering this investigation into mandating some answers. You can get the community pumped up enough where we say it's time that we we get and we deserve an update um, because this has shifted we've had two suspect sketches now we've had four names and let's get this real clear there are people in the true crime world people who follow these podcasts who follow these cases who aren't exactly clear yet that Anthony Schatz is a pseudonym not a fourth person of interest and so as every name evolves, as every new individual evolves, this just dissects the case and spreads it out thinner from my perspective. Um, we've talked over the last couple, you know, last year on this, that you have to really rule in or rule out and then move on. This just continues to be a cluster, so to speak, of, of additional names and additional profiles. They have to get a handle on this. Um, Anya and Kevin, we have about 20 seconds left here for you guys. Um, your thoughts about this case getting solved based on everything you know, are we really close or are we kind of like spinning around like we have been for five years? I think that it's so important for everybody to remember uh, that 
the case isn't solved yet. And, you know, just because we have some names now and we have some people to discuss, it's really important that we keep on pressing and keep on looking for Abby and Libby's killer. This is not over yet. The police still need information. We still need to be looking for whoever did this and took these girls away from their families. So I would just stress that, you know, nobody should make any conclusions until this is adjudicated. The Murder Sheet Podcast, amazing stuff. Um, Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee, thank you so much for your uh, time tonight, and we'll speak again. Uh, hopefully you'll come back on in, in the future as we continue to follow the story. Jason and Eric are going to stay with us. When we come back, we're going to hear what the Indiana State Police had to say today about all of this. Don't go anywhere. See, simplified.
you have any information, please contact law enforcement by utilizing the tip email, Abby and Libby tip at C-A-C-O-S-H-R-F.com. Still an active investigation, and we've been talking a lot about the Delphi murders tonight and this new information uh, that the Murder Sheet podcast uncovered. Um, and we invited the Indiana State Police on, and uh, they declined. But let me read their statement uh, to us tonight. It reads as follows. Recently, as you may already know, there have been, there's been some material released by a local podcast which was not provided to them by either the Indiana State Police nor the Delphi Double Homicide Task Force. As such, we are politely declining your request as the integrity of this investigation must and always will come first. Now, I'd also like to read a statement from um, uh, Doug Carter here. I would like to remind the public that this is an active and ongoing investigation and we will do everything we can to protect its integrity and to not try it in the court of public opinion. We cannot publicly convict someone based on a single document which was not released by investigators. Our profession will not allow us to speak on what we think, but to always speak about what we know. This is especially important with the heinous murders of Abby and Libby. We must continue to be mindful of their surviving family members and the entire Carroll County community who are affected by this investigation. Again, that's from the Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter. Still with me, private investigators Jason Jensen and Erica Morse. Um, so as we wrap up this hour, this relationship where I started this whole thing between the media and police, um, how, do we, how do we make this better? How, how do... How do we work this relationship in this case at this point, Erica, to get to the solution that everyone wants? Because as Judge Ashley told me in the beginning here, people in that area are still scared now to go to that trail. They don't go there anymore. They used to go there all the time. They don't go there anymore. Correct. And that happens in a lot of cases where it's a cold case and the community doesn't have answers and they feel that law enforcement, law enforcement isn't supporting them by providing those answers. Listen, I've been trying to figure out how to increase and better the relationship between the media and law enforcement for 30 years. It's been something I've been doing my entire career. And you and I both know that that response from ISP was double-sided. It was, the, you know, they always say they're in, they're protecting the integrity of the investigation. They're always going to throw shade or throw mud at a podcaster or reporter who uncovers something that doesn't fit with their narrative. And my only answer to that is, um, Vinny, you're not aware, but just in the, the time that we've been off for the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, I've sent in two tips, two tips to the task force from viewers coming to me from your program. So what law enforcement needs to understand is that tips don't go away just because you don't communicate with the public. If you want them to, if you want people to back down and stop asking questions, give us something to work from. Give us something to understand. Right now, there are a lot of unopened or open questions and there are a lot of not a lot of answers and until we get those people are going to try to solve this case in the court of public opinion that's just how it is jason jensen i'll give you the final word tonight on um this case jason did he freeze i lost him he froze on us erica how about that so <laughs> So, Erica, which one do you think is is, is a is a better route here at this point? Is is it? I can I can. Oh, you I can, can hear. There can you go, Jason. Everything. Oh, there's Jason. There we go. Sorry. Your feed froze. I Sorry know you're a man of that. you're a man of a lot of words. So when you weren't speaking, I got a little worried. So so tell me your thoughts tonight, Jason, on how uh, the media police can can work together here um, to help the public and obviously help the family get some some justice and answers here. Sure. One of the things that they can answer for us all, it was brought up to you or by you earlier, was the why sketches? Why are we dealing with a couple of sketches that may or may not look like the, the video that we already have? Why not enhance the quality of the video? Why, why are the sketches so significant when they have really nothing to do with the video at all? Where you even go to the, the reward uh, uh, posters today, it'll still identify that the suspect is the individual in Libby German's Snapchat video. So 
If that individual is the suspect, why do these sketches not look like that individual? We'd like to know. Usually a sketch comes from an eyewitness. So help us understand that and maybe uh, it'll bring some order for uh, ISP's uh, uh, case. Absolutely. It's a head scratcher for me, but uh, thank you so much. Jason Jensen, Erica Morris, great to see you. We'll see you again real, real soon. When we come back, folks, we're going to bring in our legal think tank and talk about the next live trial here on Court TV. In Winter Park, Florida, Danielle Redlick makes a desperate 911 call. Her husband has suffered a terrible injury. He might have had a heart attack. I don't know. Did you just find him? No, actually, it happened last night. But what really happened to Michael Redlick? Did he have a heart attack? 
Did he attempt suicide? Did he attack his wife and then she kill him in self-defense? Or did she murder him? That's what an Orange County, Florida jury will have to decide as we get ready for the next live trial on Court TV. Meanwhile, more fallout from the stunning Johnny Depp trial and verdict. Everyone wondering, what is next for Camille Vasquez, the attorney who took on Amber Heard on cross-examination? You wanted to be seen, excuse me, as a noble victim of domestic violence. I have you never, never wanted to be seen as a victim. And on the docket in Las Vegas, Nevada, the Playboy model murder trial, Kelsey Turner, accused of the brutal murder of a California doctor who allegedly gave her hundreds of thousands of dollars. I warned him when he was there that, you know, Maybe you ought not wait to come home. Maybe you ought to just come home on the next flight. Get ready. This hour of Closing Arguments starts right now. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. We're getting ready for the next live trial here on Court TV. We're going to talk about it now. Um, for those of you who don't know, before I joined Court TV the first time around, I was working down in Central Florida, Central Florida News 13, all local all the time. Um, beautiful area in the country, and there was a town there called Winter Park, which was like, that's where you wanted to live, right? You're in Central Florida, in the Orlando area. You know, that is like the town to live in, folks, with money, um, beautiful um, lakes. It was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful town. Anyhow, the next live trial, Court TV, Winter Park, Florida is where either a murder or maybe self-defense or maybe a heart attack, something took place. We know that Michael Redlick ended up dying there, and now his wife has been charged with his murder. Julie Janae has more for us tonight. I believe my husband is deceased. I, I just, he's stiff and he, I didn't want that he might have a heart attack. Michael Redlick, an executive for the University of Central Florida Sports Business Department and a former NBA executive for the Memphis Grizzlies, was found dead in his Winter Park home. Okay, did you just find him? No, actually, what happened last night? Redlick's wife, Danielle, called police to report his death, but not until 11 hours after he was fatally wounded after an argument. She initially claimed that her husband had a heart attack and then changed her story when questioned by a 911 operator. He was not okay last night. We had we had altercation and he stabbed himself and I ran into the bathroom and then when I came out, I tried to help him. When officers arrived on the scene, they found a disheveled Danielle Redlick outside her home. Police photos show Redlick with wounds to her wrist and blood on her neck and feet. She was taken to an Orlando area hospital. Inside the home, police discovered evidence of what appeared to be a violent crime, including a pile of bloody towels, bloody footprints, and a five gallon bucket filled with pink water. Police suggested it looked as if someone had been cleaning up. A serrated knife was found on the floor near the entry of the kitchen and two additional knives in the sink, all of them with traces of blood on them. Investigators interviewed Danielle Redlick at the hospital. She told them the fight between her and her husband started over a text from another man the night before a stabbing. Thursday, um... My husband was very belligerent and distraught. He found out, um, he found a text from another man to me and we had had some issues in the last year. He basically cheated on me and it was, it was a big, long, drawn out thing and we finally came around to living together again and possibly trying to work it through, but I think that really wasn't happening. And According to the police report, the couple had a complicated relationship. Redlick, 20 years older than Danielle, was first married to her mother. And after she died from cancer, Redlick began dating and eventually married his stepdaughter. But their 17-year relationship, according to investigators, was rocky, marred by alleged infidelity and arguments over dating apps. 
A family friend said that Michael Redlick even joked about the potential for violence. How are things at home or how is your wife? And he would say, as long as I can lock the knives up, I'm okay. The couple's two children, 11 and 15 years old, were not at home at the time of the alleged stabbing. Police say they told investigators that it was their mother who was volatile and argumentative. One of those fights in a separate incident prompted a call to 911 by their father. Yes, there's a woman that's a danger to herself and to others right now. Uh, a gentleman that's a danger to uh, I'm sorry. Pardon me? Pardon me? Will you stop? Oh, all right. I'll call, I will call you back. I will call you back in five minutes. Investigators say that Michael was stabbed multiple times in the torso and concluded those injuries could not have been self-inflicted. Danielle Redlick was arrested and charged with her husband's murder and also with trying to conceal evidence. She has pleaded not guilty and maintains her innocence. If convicted, she faces up to life in prison. All right, there's a lot of parts of the story you could dive into. Um, First, the nature of the relationship, how they met, all of that. But first, let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Albert H. Wunsch III in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney, Jennifer Brandt. And in Cabaretti in the Dominican Republic tonight, criminal defense attorney, Darnell Crossland, down in the DR. How about that? Okay. Um, let, let's begin here. Before we start discussing anything in this case, I want to go back and listen to the 911 call from Danielle Redlick. And, and let's listen closely to what she tells the operator. I believe my husband is deceased. Uh, I, I just, he's stiff and he's I didn't want wounded. He might have had a heart attack. I don't know. Did you just find him? No, actually, it happened last night. He was not okay last night. We had we had altercation, and he stabbed himself. And I ran into the bathroom, and then when I came out, I tried to help him. And I saw he was lying in blood. And then okay. I tried to help he him. And I couldn't. Okay, this is an obvious problem. And Al, let's start. Which came first, the heart attack or the self-inflicted uh, knife wounds? Well, I, I think I'd have a heart attack if someone was stabbing me. So that's probably what happened in this instance. So she may not be lying in that fact. There may have been a heart attack. And it would have been precipitated by the fact that she had a serrated knife and was stabbing me multiple times. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is Darnell's on the islands. And I'm exceedingly jealous. <laughs> Problem number three is that I am also in the islands, but that's Manhattan, Staten, and Long. Okay, so that's what I want to say on that. But let's go back to this situation. This story just stinks from the head down. There is nothing in this story. I don't understand how she didn't take that plea. I don't know how she is not like pleading to the manslaughter and just saying, thank you, Lord, that I got a manslaughter uh, case out of this. Because you've got all of the, I mean, 11 hours for 911, even, even if I couldn't remember the number for information, it wouldn't take me 11 hours to find out 911. But it took her 11 to do that. And then the fact that she did the cleanup and the fact that she's got these like weird wounds on herself that look probably self-inflicted to make it look like something happened to her. This is just a horrible case. And the fact that she's getting the public defender out of all this is even more bizarre to me. Because look at this home. It's an oh, Winter Park. It's beautiful. Home. Yeah, no, it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood, uh, beautiful home. Jennifer Brandt, uh, you know, none of this makes sense. But now we, we, it's time for the trial. Everyone has a defense. They always do. The defense here, we believe, is going to be self defense. That's right. And, Absolutely. And how, how does that work? How do you go from heart attack to suicide to self defense and do it with a straight face? Well, I mean, she's going to claim that she was abused by him. He was he was unfaithful. He was a bad husband. He was abusive to her. It was self-defense. She had no other choice. She was shocked by what happened. That's what took her so long to call 911. I mean, OK, maybe it's not all plausible, but I think it's a defense. And I, I think that's what she's going to assert. I mean, that he's look at the what I can't get by in this case is the fact that he was her. She was his stepdaughter. And then he married her. 
that's pretty bizarre in itself. So she's much younger and she can say, look, I, you know, he was controlling me. He was abusing me all throughout the marriage. I mean, there's a lot of things she can come up with and he's not there to uh, say that it's wrong. So I, I think she does have a defense and that's probably why she didn't take the plea. Yeah, I'm listening to those words, come up with. I always hear that <laughs> from, from the defense, Darnell. Why is that? They're going to come up with something. Why do you have to come up with something? Why, why, why can't we just tell the I truth? I the truth, Vinny. Why can't we just tell the truth, truth Darnell? The truth. Why, why does the defense always have to come up with something? It's because they believe that the prosecution is right, and they believe that you're presumed guilty and you've got to prove yourself innocent, and that's really what our system of justice has come down to. That's why we have to come up with something. But the truth of the matter is, uh, in this particular case, I think Jennifer's right. We're heading towards an extreme emotional distress defense, and the whole setup uh, here, if, if this gentleman, um, that was his natural daughter, um, the jury would be looking at him as though he was the villain. Now, I think they're going to be able to extrapolate that same feeling, even though it's his stepdaughter. He exercised all this control, all this power over her, and now um, there's probably going to be a history of mental control, physical control, and forget about the 911 calls. She probably was losing it. And I think that's why, to Al's point, she didn't take the manslaughter, because she's going to have her day in court and say, this was my father, and this was what I've been subjected to. So um, we don't have to come up with anything. We just have to present the case to the jury. And I think that she's going to have I a like, I like argument. it better when you say that, because when you say, what are we going to come up with, uh, you know. <laughs> Al, uh, and, um, and, and this issue is a real issue, I think, in the case, is the nature of the relationship, um, stepfather. But it seems that... You know, they had a real life together, two children that they raised. It wasn't like it was like a year and things went haywire. They were together for quite some time. They had a long relationship. So I've got to think that while it started a little different than most relationships, um, by the time you're, you're in the middle of the whole thing, you're raising a family, it might have some level of normalcy? Or am I completely off base here? Well, I mean, you know, it gives credence to the adage, uh, you know, all marriage is relative. But under the circumstances, this was a relationship that seemed to have been good. It didn't seem like it was something that was taking advantage of a stepdaughter position and things along those lines. She had kids with him. She had an age difference. She didn't seem to mind living in this million dollar house. She didn't seem to mind that, uh, you know, he was providing for her. I mean, there doesn't seem to be that this is the stepdaughter and, and you know, he's taking advantage of her and, and that this happened, like you said, just, you know, months after the, they buried the mom, all of a sudden, you know, he's running after her into the bedroom. So I don't think that's going to work to her advantage by any stretch of the imagination. I, and, you know, come up with, I, I, I agree with Darnell. I mean, that's not the, the phrase. You have to throw things out there that are plausible so that you can, you know, throw try to things some out there. Down. Now the defense <laughs> is just throwing things out there. Come on, yeah, now. This is. It's a search for the it. truth, and Let's we're just throwing it. things out there. Let's face it. Let's face it. This situation, it, you're not going to be able to get around an 11 hour gap. Okay, on a scenario with regards to... Unless you've to got a, a psychological expert to come in and explain what she's going through. That's the only way you know, I see it. I'm, ben, I'm not ben. selling it. I'm ben, just throwing ben, it ben. out there, Al. I'm just throwing ben, it out that's, there. That, no, that's like, Vinny, you know... Al's like, talking, talking about uh, marriages. Wait, I'm sorry. So I can say, Al, wait, wait, Al, just, just stop it. Al's talking about marriages, and I can say as a divorce attorney, you know, you never know what's going on behind closed doors with people, and they may seem like they have a great relationship, and just because they have kids together doesn't mean that they have a great marriage. Let me tell you, there's plenty of people out there that have kids together that don't have great marriages, so I think there is trouble in this marriage. I think she's, gonna, she's going to present the truth that there was a difficult relationship um, that he was controlling, she was emotionally abused, and that's her defense, that's her truth, um, because you don't like to say, come up with things. Um, and so I think- I'm not the one who says it. It's the defense play. attorneys who always say it. I don't say it. They're the ones. Darnell, does she have to testify in this case? Um, she doesn't have to, but in my experiences, um, and you know, again, winning several trials in a row as of late, 
Um, I do believe that even though, um, <laughs> in the Caribbean, in the even Caribbean, though we, even though there. we say to the to the jury when we pick them, we say, um, you understand this individual has a right not to testify. Can you not hold that against them? Juries time and time again indicate that they want to hear the other person's side. So she doesn't have to, but I think this is such a human story that I think they'll benefit from having her testify. Yeah, I think I think she has to because she has to explain that that phone call to this jury. They have to understand why. Uh, and, and maybe a psychologist might do it uh, or someone else, but she has to explain because it doesn't make sense. I think Al is right on with that, that the 11 hours that you're waiting, and, and there's now, this is the third version of, of what happened because you listen to 911, it's a heart attack, then it's suicide, then we're at trial, and we've got a brand new story. Anyhow, when we come back, think tank with us the whole hour. Uh, we've got some more fallout from the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, Camille Vasquez. What is next for her? The woman who is really the breakout star of this trial, the one who cross-examined Amber Heard. What's her next step? Huh.
Outerwear at Nix.com. Hi, everyone. Today's verdict confirms what we have said from the beginning, that the claims against Johnny Depp are defamatory and unsupported by any evidence. We are grateful, so grateful to the jury for their careful deliberation, to the judge and the court staff who have devoted an enormous amount of time and resources towards this case. Clearly the breakout star of that trial. Now the whole team did a great job for Johnny Depp, but everyone's talking about Camille Vasquez because she had that moment. She is the one who cross-examined Amber Heard during the trial. Chanley Painter has more about Camille Vasquez. Who exactly is she? That's the knife you gave to the man who was hitting you. You're the one who assaulted someone with a bottle in Australia. You weren't scared of him at all, were you? From courtroom counsel to internet celebrity, Camille Vasquez has become known around the world for her zealous advocacy of Johnny Depp. She would tell him he wasn't man enough because he wouldn't stay and fight with her. She didn't let up when it came to her cross-examination of ex-wife Amber Heard. As of today, you have not paid $3.5 million of your own money to the ACLU. Yes or no? I have not yet. Her repeated objections, Actually, now gone know. viral, had Heard's attorney struggling for momentum, all caught on TikTok and other social media platforms with millions of views. Do you know whether the records, medical records, uh, from your EMT were produced in discovery. Objection, in Your Honor. Lack of foundation calls for speculation. I'm just I'm I'm asking. overruled if she knows. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And do you rec do you recall? I'm trying. I'm trying. The 38-year-old Vasquez has become the darling of debt fans. Vasquez made her legal bones in California. She's an associate at Brown Rudnick. According to her firm's bio, her current practice focuses on plaintiff side defamation lawsuits. She went to law school in Los Angeles, graduating magna cum laude from the University of Southern California and received her law degree from Southwestern Law School. No further questions, Your Honor. Johnny Depp showed his appreciation for her cross-examination of Amber Heard with a hug and is often seen pulling her chair out for her. She does have critics who say her contempt for Heard's claims is a setback for abuse victims. But her supporters say she's standing up for male victims of domestic violence. Rockstar lawyer doesn't have, I mean, cheers, like, like, an eruption every time she walked out of that courthouse in, in Virginia. Uh, let's bring back in our think tank still with us, uh, Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt with us. Uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, Jennifer Brandt, what's the next step? Camille Vasquez, you have this big, big moment. You know, Hollywood's knocking on the door a little bit for her. Um, other law firms, what do, what do you do with all of this if you're, if you're a lawyer who suddenly becomes a rock star lawyer? Well, she's got the world at her hands, so she'll decide her next move and where she's going to go. If no, we're going to decide stay. right now. We're going to plan out the rest <laughs> of her career right here, right now. <laughs> she either decide, she either stays at her firm, which seems like seems like she's pretty happy there. They gave her a big role in this trial. Um, she had a lot of responsibility for a big client, so it seems to me that she's rising at the firm and that they have a lot of confidence in her for sure. Um, or she'll move on somewhere else you know continue her legal career i understand she even has television offers but you know what's so amazing is that we're talking about her like she's so amazing and she is great but she's is it because she's a woman who actually can do her job is that why we're all so shocked because it seems to me that that's what she was doing she was a great lawyer she did a fantastic job for johnny depp but why are we so shocked by that well i don't and think we're shocked i mean have question. you watched some of the trials on court tv sometimes we have some really <laughs> not i'm not gonna say bad but very like wow that was the cross-examination this was exactly. this was a moment I mean, the it was world, the moment the world is, the world is talking about her you know with amazement because she did such a fantastic job but they're she did her job and she did it really really well and that's great you know and i think we should just we shouldn't be so surprised i guess that's i'm, I'm, I'm not surprised i'm wondering what the next move is darnell crossland where, what does she do How, what does what does a lawyer do who now becomes a rock star 
Well, a couple of things. I, I'm going to be a hater Good for a little you're while. Asking him but, that question. Yeah, Good exactly. Thing you're asking Darnell that question. <laughs> You know, I'm going to have to be a hater for a little while. We watch a lot of these cases on court TV, and, you know, you have these extreme difficult cases, murder cases, et cetera, and I've done these. And, you know, we don't get the credit that we deserve. Then you have this case that plays on forever where these people get this big purse, and I'm not saying that she, she wasn't doing her job, but it was like, did you see her hit Johnny? Did you see him by the elevator? What happened then? And who was in the bed? I mean, there was nothing really like genius here and that's the thing that gets me sometimes and you got people down south in georgia right now some lawyers that no one's watching their cases that's doing some really heavy lifting and then and they get no credit for it so she's a young lady um i'm hating a little bit but what's next for her is the same thing that's for all the other big lawyers who represented uh chris brown michael jackson etc they're going to run the circuit and everyone's going to go to them for a little while and then they'll just die out and be back you know, back to where they were. Um, you know, it, fame doesn't last long these days. Fascinating. Uh, should I ask Al or not? Should I go on to the next subject? Uh, no, Skip wait Al. a minute. Skip Al. <laughs> well, Al, Al. But Al, you were a rock star first, then you became a lawyer. So it's, it, that you know, is correct. You've got the whole thing backwards. But if we really want to make news, um, she should come out and say that she's dating Johnny Depp. Then we really have some news. No, no. <laughs> Okay, oh, Al, I've got a different Sorry, question wait. for you, Al. i got a different question for you. Okay. <laughs> we got a different one. Um, I want to show you some video. This is video from the last day of the trial. I want you to take a look at the court reporter, the stenographer who takes down the official court record um, afterwards, as we can see it. Maybe drop those letters there so we can see everything on the screen. There she is, shaking hands with Johnny Depp. Okay, the court reporter shook hands with Johnny Depp. Now, I've got a second video to show you video two this is at the hotel where johnny depp is staying afterwards and that's the same court reporter this is while the the jury still has the case after closing arguments a day of deliberations and she's there with johnny depp and apparently she released a statement explaining this video which is blowing up on social media uh, she said, I guess Johnny had told them he would really like to meet the court reporter, which was shocking to me. I'm like, I'm just the court reporter. Johnny was in there, and so I had to go in there and get my equipment, and I saw him, and they're like, he really wants to meet you. I was probably in there for less than 10 minutes, and he just hugged me and thanked me again, and I hugged a couple of other people there, and I got my equipment, and I came out, left, and went home. She's a court reporter that was hired by both parties for this case. And apparently there was some equipment that was left at court that she had to retrieve from uh, Johnny Depp's team at the hotel after court. Was there anything wrong with what we just saw, Al? No. Who cares? I mean, who cares? It's just Everybody a court on social media cares. They want to know, is this They're right, is this idiots. wrong? Idiots, idiots, idiots. Who cares? Okay, and I agree with Darnell. I mean, what did what was this cross examination that this woman did? It was shooting fish in a barrel. She represented the better character, and she was able to get ahead on Amber Heard. If a I guy disagree. had tried to pull that oh, crap, well, if a guy had true. tried to pull that stuff with her, we'd all be in trouble. But because oh, no, it's a no, woman no. on a woman, an it's not a big job. deal. She, but I will tell you this. I will tell you this: that it was not that difficult. There was no, I agree true. with Darnell, there was no extraordinary moment where like, you know, the, the, the door opened and the surprise witness walked in. Nothing happened during that cross-examination. That shouldn't have happened. She did her uh, job, okay? And I agree, she, and now, she, wait a minute, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a second. I also agree that we shouldn't be singling her out that way because she was doing her job and she did her job efficiently. But she didn't have, this is not the Scopes monkey trial, okay? This was, he said, she said, and it was an absolute just shooting a fish in a barrel. He's got, he played the better character in this. And you know what? Him going over to the court reporter is just part of the character he played during this trial. And that's yeah, the whole what, thing with this. Second, Johnny Al, Depp was wait, a wait. better character. He's not a better Okay, Al, 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 not a better Al, you, you've used Al, up, you've used up Al, the rest of the time from the trial. There we go. Go Al, ahead, Joe. Listen, listen, 
you know, you can't you can't underestimate what she did. She did an excellent job. And I think that's why we're all talking about her and I mean her objections and everything. And it wasn't shooting fish in a barrel because her cross examination stood on its own. I mean, Johnny Depp, yes, he testified. That had nothing to do with her. She was really good in that cross examination with Amber Heard. She had she Amber Heard on her job. toes. Oh no, but she did more than her job. She did an excellent job. And I don't think you can you can say that she didn't. Um, and I don't Darnell, think it was so me. easy. I mean, look, this is in front of cameras. This is a long trial. And she held her own in that trial with a lot of other lawyers who were more senior than her, more experienced than her. And I think that's why people are talking about her because she really she really showed that she's an excellent lawyer. And that's why she you know, stepped she up, have, she met the moment and uh, won the case. And, All right. And that's why they yeah. gave her the responsibility probably Absolutely. to do that because they knew she was so good. All right, I have a programming note to bring all of you tonight. You ready? Court TV's Chanley Painter will sit down one-on-one -on -one with Johnny Depp's attorney in his defamation case, Ben Chu. The entire interview will premiere Wednesday night right here on Closing Arguments. Ben Chu, Chanley Painter, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you will see it right here. When we come back, we're going to take you on the docket tonight. The Playboy model murder trial, Kelsey Turner, accused of murdering a doctor who apparently gave her hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why would she do that? We'll preview the trial next.
Hillary with Worthy.com. On the docket tonight, the Playboy model murder trial. Ted Rollins has the story of Kelsey Turner. Renowned psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Burchard had been missing for three days when his body was found in the trunk of an abandoned BMW in the desert outside of Las Vegas. Judy Earp, his girlfriend of 17 years, was back at their home in California and sensed the doctor was in trouble. Uh, I told him repeatedly that these are not, you know, the people, you, the kind of people you want to be associating with. Judy was worried about this woman, 25-year-old playboy and Maxim model Kelsey Turner. Judy says Kelsey was extorting money from Dr. Burchard. About 300000 that I know about and possibly more. Burchard had a history of helping others and engaging with young, attractive girls he met online like Kelsey. That's according to his friend who did not want to be identified when he was interviewed by KSBW. These women were just like an escape for him to, to, to have somewhere to go. He told me he met Kelsey on a website and uh, met up with her and, and they talked and they went and had dinner a few times. Dr. Burchard's friend says the psychiatrist started spending time and money on Kelsey, even renting this condo in Salinas, California for Kelsey and her mother to live along with Kelsey's child. Even after Dr. Burchard stopped paying the rent and Kelsey moved to Vegas, the two did keep in contact. And shortly before the murder, Kelsey reached out to the doctor, according to his friend. He says, seems, seems that Kelsey's having some trouble with her boyfriend out there in Vegas. Um, he's hating her. He's um, abusing her. And she has no money, nowhere to go. And I feel partly responsible for this. Court documents show that Kelsey Turner was, in fact, reported as the victim in a domestic violence case less than a month before the doctor's murder. Dr. Burchard went to Vegas to see Kelsey, calling his girlfriend Judy only after he had arrived, saying he was spending the weekend and would be back on Monday. I warned him on Saturday when he was there that, you know, maybe you ought not wait till Monday to come home. Maybe you ought to just come home on the next flight. After missing his flight and not responding to calls and texts, Judy called Las Vegas police. Dr. Burchard's body was found near Lake Mead, about 25 miles outside Vegas. The actual incident occurred at a residence in the Las Vegas Valley, and then the body was found out by the lake. This is the Las Vegas home where Kelsey and her boyfriend, John Kennison, were living and where investigators believe Dr. Burchard was murdered. Kelsey's roommate, Diana Pena, told a grand jury that Kennison attacked Dr. Burchard with a baseball bat and that after the initial attack, Kelsey insisted that her boyfriend knock him out. Pena also testified that the attack left Kennison covered in blood. According to arrest warrants, police recovered a bag from the Rio Hotel. It's where prosecutors say Turner, Kennison, and Pena fled to after the murder. Inside that bag, investigators found sheets of paper ripped from Dr. Burchard's notebook that contained his banking information and passwords. Uh, additional information has come to light. Kelsey Turner was arrested in California three weeks after police recovered Burchard's body. Her extradition was delayed after it was determined that she was pregnant. She has since given birth to a girl while in custody. Her boyfriend, John Kennison, was arrested a few weeks later in Las Vegas. Both are facing murder charges. Kelsey's roommate, Diana Pena, pleaded guilty to accessory to murder and is expected to testify at their trials. All right, let's bring back in our think tanks. Still with us, Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt. Darnell, um, there's a case, co-defendants, a lot of places to point the finger. Um, but you know what? She's the one with the connection to the doctor. She's the one who's, you know, getting hundreds of thousands of dollars. She's the one who kind of lures him to Vegas. That's a problem, I think. Uh, I, I do. And um, when you look at this case, I, I, I studied it. Um, and all I can come up with is the fact that you have a cooperator right now. So the idea is that she has to get in sync with that cooperator. Um, there's not going to be a, a snow's, you know, chance that she's not in sync with that cooperator and does well. So somehow 
she's going to have to state that, you know, she brought the doctor out there. She just wanted to get some money and her boyfriend went off the reservation and went too far. And then, and then she's going to hopefully get a plea that, that she can see the light of day one day. But to say that she had nothing to do with it is not going to work. Yeah, Al, I, I look at the, the connection, the, the, the old but for test, right? But for Kelsey Turner, Dr. Burchard is not going to Vegas. That's very, very true. Very, very true. It's going to be, it'll be very difficult in a case like this with regards to that kind of an issue. Um, and it, it just, and just so you know, Vin, I, uh, my subscription to the Italian Playboy starts next week, since you pointed that out that I, I didn't have the right Playboy magazine collection. So I, I am getting that. So we'll be able to do some research on that. And I just like to point out that today is the 70th, 78th anniversary of the Battle of D-Day. And that those boys stormed that beach so that Darnell could lay on his. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Absolutely. Jennifer Brandt, where do you see this trial going? Um, Kelsey Turner has not gotten a deal. The roommate took a deal. I don't know if there's going to be a second deal laid out there. If she goes to trial, does she just sit there and point the finger at the boyfriend and say that she is a victim as well? Yeah, I don't think she has a choice. I mean, she had a good relationship with the doctor for a long time. And, you know, maybe she just she just says, you know, that the boyfriend, the boyfriend caused all of this. The boyfriend, as Darnell had said, sort of went off the reservation and just, you know, attacked the doctor who was there to just, you know, tell her that he was cutting her off. And maybe that caused obviously some friction and the boyfriend got upset. So I think that's her best shot at any of this uh, of getting you know getting herself out of this mess um but i don't know it's the roommate the roommate may uh may come in and 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 cause trouble for both kelsey and her boyfriend so i think darnell was right she's got to get in sync with the roommate or she's gonna have some problems for sure and, darnell and also Vinny, go ahead uh, uh, in the bumper they showed the police report that substantiates the fact that she was a victim of domestic violence as well so as jennifer would know from doing matrimonial stuff um again we're back at that same page again um so someone was beating her and um i couldn't tell from the bumper and the police reports whether it was her boyfriend but um if it was her boyfriend then the argument could be that he was beating the hell out of her he made her bring him out here and was like you better get him out here or i'm gonna kill you um and so there's some pressure there does does she garner any sympathy in our system of justice for being a, a, a mother of a young child? We saw in her first court appearance she was uh, pregnant. There she is with her mom. Uh, but she was pregnant in one of her first court appearances. Does that have anything to do with what is going to happen to her, Al? It, it certainly could play a role. I mean, you may get some sympathy with regards to that. And that, you know, she's going to say, I value life. I'm a mother. I gave birth uh, to ch a child. And that, you know, this means so much to me. I'm not going to take someone else's life, especially someone who was so good to me and things along those lines. It may very well work for her advantage in that. We shall see. All right. When we come back, time to hear from you, our 13th juror. And it all focuses on a case out of Los Angeles involving a juvenile driving a car down an alley, mows down a, a young mom with her baby in a stroller. She ends up surviving, as does the baby, but the 16-year-old behind the wheel gets the deal of a lifetime from the DA. Was justice served? Next.
comfort technology. Got a case out of Los Angeles causing some outrage by some. It's some wild video from KABC in Los Angeles. Uh, I gotta warn you, the video is graphic, may be disturbing. You've got a 16-year-old behind the wheel of a car going down an alley, and there you see a mom with a stroller. Mom survived, baby survived. But now the 16-year-old tries to get away. Is ultimately, we'll watch it one more time. You can see steering towards the mother with the baby. It's this sick stuff. Sick stuff. The driver of that vehicle, 16 years old, got a deal. Five months in a youth camp. Five months in a youth, well, five to seven months in a youth camp. 13th juror, comment of the day, was justice served. Here's what Karen has to say about all that. Are you kidding me? No, justice wasn't served. The leniency in the judicial system doesn't make anyone afraid to do a crime. Darnell, I'll begin with you on this one. 16 well, years old, steering at the mom and a baby. They survive miraculously. Five months in a youth camp? We, we just, uh, we, we're, we're presuming facts, not in evidence. There's nothing that's before us that said he was intending to uh, cause her any harm. It could have been an accident. So that's the first thing. So just because she got hit and looks very, very bad, as you And said, drove away. Oh, uh, that's a problem. So he probably got the five months for leaving the scene of an accident, not for trying to kill anyone. And so we, we know um, from Miller versus Alabama, um, that when it comes to juveniles, there's a certain different level of engagement that the courts take. Also, we know that juveniles can't commit crimes, only delinquent acts. So that's why we call them juvenile delinquents. So, so it's not really what people are looking at. So there's a lot more that we lawyers have to dissect when looking at these cases. I don't know. I, I'm dissecting a young mom on the hood of the car. I, that's what I'm saying. I, 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 mean, I look at the video, looked like he was pretty much steering at her, and then once he hit her, was driving away. Um, Brandon tonight, justice was not served. A much longer sentence would be needed, in my opinion, if the driver did it on purpose. Okay. Let me ask you, Jennifer Brandt, what, what, you know, was justice served here? I mean, is, is the kid gonna learn his lesson and never do that again? No, justice was not served here. And I, th I believe that the this person was driving a stolen car. So I think that makes it even Worse. We're not talking about a 16 year old who's learning how to drive and, you know, runs into this woman. We're talking about someone in a stolen car, obviously getting away and hitting this woman and then getting five months. I just, in a youth, youth camp, camp, youth camp. I, I, yeah, I, I just can't see that the justice was served in that way at all. And this poor woman, thankfully, she was okay and thankfully the baby was okay, but it could have been a lot worse. Certainly looks that way. Michelle, nope, no deal. Send driver away, and a lifetime ban on a driver's license sends the correct message, period. Al Wunsch, your thoughts? Was justice served here five months in the youth camp? Well, I, it's, it's odd, Vinny. I have a very similar case that happened in New Jersey uh, with a FedEx vehicle that struck a au pair and a baby and then left the scene. And if it wasn't for a doorbell cam that was able to catch it, uh, we probably wouldn't have been able to find the person that did it. So it's a very similar situation, ran them over and then left the scene. It's despicable, but he's 16 years of age. I didn't know about the stolen vehicle. I didn't see that. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I, I think that if there was a stolen vehicle involved, there's certainly going to be another charge on that. And it's not what they charged him with, it seems like. And no one knows with regards to the license. Because I'm sure there's going to be, every time there's a, an accident with some sort of an injury, um, you can be looked at, especially at 16 years of age. So he's certainly going to be getting some sort of driving restrictions, whether it's going to be a lifetime ban, I can't imagine that. Three-time DWI in New Jersey, and you can get your license back in eight years. So I can't imagine that he's going to lose his license for life. It is a privilege, but you know, I, there's, he's a kid. He made a mistake. He did a stupid thing. He fled the scene. He panicked. 
Okay. I don't think he was intentionally trying to hit them. Okay. The same thing that the FedEx guy said, in my case, the FedEx guy ended up getting probation. So there's really no difference. He didn't even have to go to a camp or anything along those lines. He got uh, a third degree assault and was given pro probation on it. So I, I can't say that the five months in, in a youth camp is a slap on the wrist. It is a sentence. It is going to be taking away his freedom for five months. And finally, Donna says, if the driver purposely ran over a baby and mom, then youth camp is just reinforcement to that 16-year-old that the lives of other people are really irrelevant. Hopefully not getting that message. Big thank you, Al Wunsch, Jennifer Brandt, Darnell Crossland. Enjoy the DR, my man. We'll see you again. When we come back, folks, I've got some more information uh, that you need so you can help us. That's the next.
Welcome back. Before we go, uh, I need to show you a photograph of a missing child. Take a close look. This is Lamar Hammond, 13 years old, missing from Dayton, Ohio, since May 25th. If you see Lamar, please pick up the phone. You can call 1-800-THE-LOST. Um, you can call the Dayton Police Department. Uh, please let them know that you've seen Lamar. Let's see if we get Lamar back to safety. That's it. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Vinny Politan. Have a great night. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. Up next, a college girl goes missing and police suspect murder. A cryptic text message provides a salacious clue. And that was code for sex. Shenanigans is sex. In the back of my mind, I think I knew that something wrong had happened.